Hey everybody, welcome back. My name is Nelson Everhart, and this is the musical tour of The Spiral. This time we're going to look at a track from Grizzleheim, which was the seventh world released in Wizard 101. And this time I got an email saying, all right, we need music for Viking bears. So I usually start when there's an obvious cultural uh, reference that we're going from by doing just a little bit of research and trying to steep myself in what the expectations of the uh, of that style are. And I was surprised to learn this time that uh, we don't actually know much about Viking music. The Vikings were around long before there was any way of recording music, obviously not audio recording, but you know, writing it down in music notation. There's a lot of things that are probably influenced by it, but nothing that we can you know, point directly to. There were a couple ways that we might make uh, intelligent guesses about what the music would have sounded like. One of them was the instruments, um, instruments themselves that were revealed through archaeological digs and most of those were about uh, were pan flutes and you know pipes and larger wind instruments but there's no it's not like I could go out and buy uh, a library of Viking instruments because they, they just didn't exist. There's a story of a traveler traveling through Denmark and heard the Vikings singing and said, the growling sounds coming from their throats reminded me of dogs howling only more untamed. So, didn't have a lot to go on based on that. Let's play the track, and then we'll talk about it in a minute. So I was only asked to write, I believe, three tunes, three or four tunes for Grizzleheim, and this was the first one, so this is scene setting. So the only thing that we know about Viking music was that they used these, you know, uh, horns, these larger horns. Uh, I wanted to start there, so I'm using an instrument called a ragdung, which is actually an Asian instrument, uh, but it's the same kind of idea. It's, I'm not sure if this is in the range of one of these but I, I wanted it to be kind of a low call maybe imagining that the the vikings were you know calling to each other from ship to ship across a bay Get that nice and low and then i doubled that with just some trombones give it a little more low menace at the bottom and as we know the the viking sort of musical traditions probably spread out throughout a lot of europe um, i wanted to use some irish uh inspiration so this is a, a frame drum there's a irish frame drum called a bodron which i think this is kind of mostly modeled on and it's just a you know a regular kind of animal skin stretched across a, f a frame really easy to play with the hand and the vikings 
Vikings probably, you know, uh, were very well traveled and got a lot of different cultures. I put a Japanese taiko drum on, underneath that just for some more power. These bears are nice and big and powerful. Some more low drums in there. And then this instrument is called a yali tambour. I'm probably slaughtering the name again. It's a, a Turkish stringed instrument. It's supposed to look like a banjo with a longer neck, and you play it with a, a bow. So a very warbly kind of sound. I wanted to indicate that the, the bears had kind of a, a more wild culture, a more sort of folksy, uh, earthy culture. So I was trying to look for instruments that, that were just a little more wild, a little less restrained. So for example, this is a, these are alpen horns. This is just kind of a, a, a low, kind of a low horn uh, sound, but it, doesn't sound quite as smooth as what I would normally, I'd normally score those for like brass horns. But I, and, and I did in fact, you know, back them up a little bit with that, but I wanted sort of a more wild horn sound there. So a little rough, rougher sound in there. The Yelly Tambor also has this strings that I think are kind of meant to be uh, played as drones uh, while there's a, another string that's kind of a lead part here. So that drone kind of just holds down the root note as the, the melody kind of moves over top of it. It's actually kind of reminiscent of bagpipes and some more Irish uh, instruments. And I did in fact use the uh, Illin pipes and I bought some new libraries over the uh, holiday break there. <laughs> I spent a lot of money on libraries. Uh, and this is from the Cinesamples Cinewinds Pro library. The, the original Ellen pipe here didn't sound bad. I like kind of the, the overblown transition in between the notes as the, the piper would move his fingers around. The new one is a little more... has some, some smoother legato transitions. And I mixed it way back further in the reverb. Together, I think they, they help it uh, punch through some busier background here. Later on, I, I, I'll use one or the other here, using the old Ellen pipe, and then this is the, the newer one. I didn't want that to be too up front. I wanted it to be a little buried a little bit further back. So this line here actually kind of does something interesting. It's in the key of F and it's at the beginning here, we're just playing Fs and Cs, right? Fs, F, C, F, and getting it there. So we don't have any actual idea if we're kind of in a major mode or a minor mode. We don't know if it's kind of a lighter sound or a darker sound yet because it hasn't really been defined because there's no third. The third of the chord is what provides the, the, the character, the flavor. And that could be either light or dark. So we could either flavor it with the A natural, which is the, the third, major third, and it sounds lighter, or we could give it the A flat, make it sound darker. Uh, now the key of F major just has one B flat in it. So if I wanted to play that line in uh, a major, I would go. But, but I don't use that B flat here. I use, instead use the, uh, the B natural. Which actually turns it into a kind of a, a Lydian mode, if you want to look that up. So a little more exotic than just, you know, straight away uh, major chord, because I didn't, didn't I didn't want to give away too much too soon because these first two phrases uh, use that major third, the A natural, and then notice that the third kind of time it comes around, it goes to that A flat. So this is flipping from a, a major chord to the same minor chord. So an F major chord to an F minor chord. And I think that 
that's kind of an interesting harmony and it's not i find it a really interesting flavor especially in pop music when pop music goes back and forth because if you're in f major you know maybe it feels good you feel like you're at home and then it goes to f minor you don't really know when you can feel comfortable so i think psychologically it kind of throws a little monkey wrench in that harmonic works now, I actually tuned this frame drum to the key that we're playing in. A lot of times, you're not really considering the fact that drums are, you know, have pitches. Here in contact, you can see that here's my frame drum, and I have tuned it up three tones. That's where it normally was. But when I was I decided to uh, pitch this song in F, it just felt better to have that uh, fr frame drum tuned to the same thing. actually added in the clarinets and bassoons here I think I was working kind of uh, unconsciously literally again where I wanted this to sound woodier I wanted it to sound you know more reedy because these bears are in the woods so when I was remixing here I replaced the the old uh, east-west sounds with the new cine sample cine winds libraries here because they were definitely an upgrade and sounded a lot better. Something I always listen for is dynamics in music. It makes music interesting to me. Music that's too in your face constantly or music that's too, you know, just low energy constantly. I, I lose interest with both of them. I think that music needs to have, you know, the light and the dark. It needs to have tension and release. It needs to have like major stuff and minor stuff and fast stuff and slow stuff. I find that the the art is in finding kind of a balance between there. So a lot of my uh, sort of exploratory music, just scene setting music, I decided a long time ago that I, that I did want it to be dynamic. I wanted to, you know, not just sort of sit in the background. I, I find it a bit of a challenge to write just, you know, music that doesn't go anywhere, that doesn't really have any aspirations or, or any direction, particular direction that it wants to go. I, I want the music to feel like it's developing and feel like it's exploring different sides of, of the same subject. So I, I let it get a little out of hand here for a little bit. It's real exciting. And then we get to the next section and it kind of breaks it back down. Uh, the old recorder was from, I, uh, I think it was from East West Quantum Leap Ra, and I used a new one. Another another library I picked up from Embertone, which does some of my favorite. I have an ocarina library from them. I have another library called Jubal Flute that's it's just some fantastic legato transitions between the notes. So these recorders were on sale for a ridiculously uh, low price, and they sound great. Plus, you get a whole range of recorders. You can play low to high. They sound very good and windy, I guess if I can use that, like... A lot of times when you play low on a recorder, it's got this very, oh, like a breathy, windy kind of sound. And you can't blow too hard when you're playing down low on the recorder. And you can hear that come through the sound uh, of these samples, which is why I like them better than the originals. Right there. When I listen back to older music, I, I find that I remember these little lines because they're, they're very just kind of memorable little uh, interstitial parts. And I think they add a lot to the, the character and memorizability of the, of the tune. But one of the difficulties I've had in trying to demonstrate this part is that this uh, stringed instrument actually has different uh, key switches, which means different sample sets that you switch between by uh, playing a note kind of out of the normal range of the instrument. So down here, this these are the key switches. So, so when you hit this F, it's the sample set switches to the tremolo part. And then when you hit this C, it goes back to the regular kind of plucked fingered sound and then back to the tremolo parts again and the old horn sound I was using actually uses this too so if you look down here these notes down here are the, the me switching the sample sets that I'm using so this is a long when you play the C sharp in this particular one then that note is nice and sustained and then when you hit the A we get the shorter notes right and then hit the C sharp again for the longer notes. So the only problem with that, I, I mean, I think that sounds really nice. And for, for a technique that you don't use very often, I think it's very useful. Uh, but more modern sample libraries are using the sustain pedal, which to me feels more natural. You press the sustain pedal down, you get sustained notes, and you lift it up, and you get more spiccato or staccato parts.
even between the horns and uh, the oud sound that I was using, uh, the key switch notes are different. So that's another reason it makes it a little bit harder to kind of perform and memorize because you know every instrument's range is different. So where they're going to put the key switches are different. So here and then the new uh, horn, this is Cine Samples horn part. Uh, I go back and forth as a, with the sustain pedal here. So it's just it's it's a more intuitive interface, I think. So here the long notes with the with the pedal down and then the short notes with the pedal up all right so that would normally do it uh we've listened to the whole track but if we scroll past the end we see oh there's some more stuff over here when i'm writing in pro tools and i come up with a part that doesn't it just it's not right for the part but maybe it'll be good for something else i tend to just sort of drag it later in the session and sometimes uh when I'm done with the track, I don't delete those. So this was a little bit of uh, unheard business at the end here. Uh, it's not mixed very well, but it's it's enough to give you the idea. Here it is. Yeah, so I'm sure you recognize the theme in there. I was trying to do something else with it. Felt like, you know, you're riding on horses or something. That that vibe didn't quite feel right for the tune. I thought maybe I might be able to work it in somewhere later, so I shoved it back here. But there it is. This is the graveyard of ideas that uh, should have been killed, and I'm glad that they were. <laughs> All right, guys, that'll do it. So I do have a question for you guys, uh, and maybe you have some ideas for me. I'm, I'm wondering how or if I should even cover uh, Winter Tusk, which was the extended part of Grizzleheim, and the music was actually composed by Nick Jonas. I had nothing to do with it. I didn't, you know, I didn't work or collaborate with that at all. That was all him. And I was just wondering if you guys, you know, want me to talk about it, or if there's an, you know, how, how it, should I cover that exactly to make sure that our tour of the spiral is is complete? Or maybe, you know, you just don't want me to talk about it at all, in which case, that's fine. Uh, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. I'll see you next time.